It's uh, lovely to be with you. It's lovely to welcome you here to Virginia Seminary. And uh, both John and I are looking forward to uh, speaking with you and uh, speaking together. Uh, If you have a Bible, it's also on the handout in front of you. I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 1, just some excerpts from the beginning of the letter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. He has made known to us the mystery of his will as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance towards redemption as God's own people to the praise of his glory. Reading these verses from Ephesians 1 is kind of like being beamed down into an extended praise service. It's like um, being handed a prayer book from another tradition already in full flow. Here we have one long celebratory sentence. Praises of God and praises of God's work tumbles forth as God's mission spills over into creation as blessing, adoption, grace, salvation, recreation, but most of all, grace. This is a hymn of praise to the mission of God. Here is the fountainhead. However we understand the mission, it is here that it begins. Mission is the work of God. Mission is first and foremost the mission of God. The first human missional act called forth by a text like Ephesians and modeled by a text like Ephesians is worship. We begin in gratitude, submission for what God has done in God's world through Christ, the gift of life, forgiveness through the indwelling of the Spirit. Mission, if you like, begins in liturgy. It begins in praise and recognition and discernment of the work of the triune God, the one who creates, recreates, reconciles. For this reason, the first of Anglicanism's five marks of mission is proclamation. God's mission begins in God's creative proclamation. Let there be light. It reaches its crescendo in God's recreative proclamation through Christ. It is finished. And it reaches its fulfillment in what Ephesians calls God's gathering up and healing of all things in heaven and earth. Unfortunately, the five marks of mission, while recognizing that proclamation is the necessary point of departure, does not really explicitly recognize the importance of worship, of spiritual discernment, or a sacramental worldview in receiving this gift of God's grace. Rather, it focuses very much on human agency, human action. And that emphasis on our work has been the root of much mission malpractice. If we are to hope 
for any renewal of mission, of church, of partnership, and of communion, we cannot sidestep this. There has been mission malpractice, and we have to face that squarely. While in principle, as Anglicans, our inspiration for our understanding, our discernment, our connection with God's mission is Scripture, let's be very honest. We have fallen short of the expansive, generous grace of God. Human actions that purport to be mission, done independent of this vision of God, can delay, dissuade, or displace healthy discernment of God's work in God's world. The vision delayed is particularly obvious when we read scholars of world Christianity. And these scholars pull no punches. And a way to illustrate that this morning, I want to turn to two theologians um, that I've listened and learned from, John Mbiti and Jesse Mugambi, both from Kenya. Africa is one of those places in the dominant cultural imagination that is often an ongoing recipient of mission. Yet, the reality of its church growth and its theological output puts it in the place not only of recipient of Western mission, but as agent of cross-cultural mission and as theological critic of Western mission. A little backdrop. In 1970, North American Anglicans were almost 10% of all Anglicans. In 2010, they constituted 3% of Anglicans worldwide. In 1970, African Anglicans were 6% of the communion. In 2010, African Anglicans were 58% of all Anglicans. Today, the Anglican tradition is a non-Western tradition. And many centers beyond the West are leaders in mission not only in terms of church growth, but also in terms of theological and missiological insight. And to begin to get at this, and as a means to try and relate their criticism to your own mission discernment, thought, and practice, I've identified some integrative questions that you should have uh, on your handout. They're on the left-hand side of that handout. And those questions are designed to try and connect with uh, the questions these scholars raise uh, connect with your own uh, context. So they've got things to say. The criticism of Mbidi and Magambi begin with the relationship between mission practice and power. For them, this relationship to power is seen particularly through the lens of colonialism and their experience of a British brand of imperialism. First, they argue missionaries could transcend domineering relationships. As part of a humanitarian lobby, missionaries sometimes protested and resisted colonial practices that were disadvantageous to converts. Mugambi can depict foreign missionaries as a buffer between, quote, rulers and citizens. Some, he writes, are people open and willing to recognize that the Spirit of God cannot be contained, controlled, or directed by any man or woman. For both of them, it's particularly Bishop John V. Taylor that needs no introduction to a crowd like this particularly Taylor, that fits into such a description. Second, while missionaries could at times transcend the dominant culture of colonialism, mission Christianity taught submission to the reigning power. For Mbiti and Mugambi, Christianity generally did not oppose colonialism, taught converts to obey the ruling powers, and opposed movements for freedom. 
Third, missionary leaders provided theological justification for the reigning power. Indeed, in the 1950s, when it appeared that an imperial Christian America was replacing an imperial Christian Britain, the general secretary of the church missionary society would propose in a series of lectures at the esteemed Virginia Seminary, he would propose a theology of imperialism. Lest contemporary Christians comfort themselves in their contempt for their forebears, Mugambi sees globalization as the successor term for imperialism and sees the Western church today justify itself and its actions in ways very reminiscent of the past. Transcending the reigning powers, intertwining with the reigning powers, and justifying the reigning powers are the themes that point to a delay of a theology of mission. A theology that would otherwise articulate and actualize the generous grace of the God of love. And that raises particular questions for us. And at this juncture, I particularly invite you to um, reflect on that first integrative question on the handout. The delay of a life-giving theology of mission had very practical implications for those coming into the orbit of foreign missionaries, say, Mbiti and Mugambi. And these implications can be summed up in the term cultural subjugation. But what does that mean? Well, for Mbiti, Mugambi, and other theologians beyond the dominant culture, it means at least four things. First, it is acculturation. And for Mugambi, that means converts being required to assimilate into, quote, the values of the dominating culture. In other words, the value and tastes embedded in theological curricula, church ritual, architecture, and art, art simultaneously enthroned Christ and white culture. Thus, to accept Christ was to accept a foreign culture. Second, subjugation means resistance to and even rejection of traditional practices. For Mbiti, missionaries and their African converts from the 19th century onwards often exhibited, in his words, a bulldozer mentality, which assumed that African traditions were demonic and therefore needed to be swept aside. And Beattie writes this, mission scandalized, vandalized, and brutally tore cultural life apart without clear theological justification. And so he argues that just as we have got to a point in scholarship where we have biblical criticism, we now need missiological criticism. Third, Subjugation means denominationalism. This they see as militating against the gospel and African sociality. On the one hand, missionaries preached unity, and on the other hand, they were involved in denominational rivalry, while at the same time criticizing founders of African-initiated churches of breaching the unity of the church. Fourth, Cultural subjugation is the importation of foreign categories. They point especially to individualism, dualism, futurism. The foreignness of the Christian message, they argue, has often meant that converts are forced to exist in two worlds. Now, some of these themes, of course, overlap, and because of that, I think we can summarize the criticism up in four terms, transcendence, propaganda, inculturation and denominationalism or competition. And that leads us to that second integrative question. In a final step, I'd like to invite you to consider the possibility of what might be termed a constructive turn. That is to say, the beginning of a move toward a renewed theology of mission that directly responds to each of these 
four criticisms. And I'm going to do that in the form of four theses uh, on mission. So thesis one, only a theology of mission guarantees the future. The criticism we've reviewed is not simply condemnation or a call to a better church for the future. It is also a lament that African theology is in continuity with so few foreign mission leaders. I think we need to remind ourselves, Catholicity is not a style of worship. Or not only, maybe, a style of worship. It is relational connection to the gospel of Christ across time and across space. Catholicity cannot be entered into without the hard work of intercultural relationship and partnership. And John's going to speak particularly to that when we get to Friday. To what extent Anglican theology and or Anglican theologies of mission remain disengaged or remote from world Christianity is something we, we may want to talk about later. To what extent our semin seminaries, our leaders, and our parishes take seriously a process of formation that robustly engages recent and current theologies from world Anglicanism is something that we might want to also talk about later. We can make a broader point here. The ability to transcend domineering thought and see a different future was predicated upon, from Mbiti and Mugambi's perspective, a deeper vision of the nature of God. And that, of course, takes us to that third integrative question. There were some people involved in cross-cultural ministry and intercultural theologizing that could see a different future for the church. That is because they had a more properly missiological view of the church and the work of the church. And fundamental to that view was the conviction that it is God who is the agent of mission. This then is a theological appeal. What they aim at is a deeper and broader vision of God. A vision that begins with the acknowledgement that the first and eternal referent for mission is God. Mission refers to the eternal love of God. In the words of Ephesians, it is God who destined us for adoption. It is God's grace that has been lavished upon us. Mission, God's work in creation, in recreation. Mission is God's work, eternal overflowing, boundary-crossing love. Thus, the call of these scholars is for a church that makes present now the future fulfillment of God's love. It is a call for a church that already echoes the vision of Revelation 21 where, quote, the kings of the earth will bring their glory into God's unveiling reign. That the criticism is theological is seen particularly clearly in Mbiti's criticism of foreign missionaries. And the strength of his work was that he called the bluff of missionaries who prided themselves on their theological orthodoxy. Mbiti argued, you take the Bible seriously? You don't take it seriously enough. You proclaim a gospel centered on Christ? It is not Christocentric enough. Both the Bible 
and a commitment to Christ has not penetrated your culture and your cultural assumptions deeply enough, is Mbidi's argument. That theological deficit results in a missiological deficit. The church takes onto itself agency that it has no right to own and thus forestalls a vision like Revelation 21. The future of the church, therefore, does church depends not on a retreat from mission and the theology of mission, but more robust theologies of mission that deepen a vision of God and puts the agency of human actors in its proper place. And that desire for a deeper vision of God and a chastened human agency takes us to this second thesis. Syncretism is only avoided by reuniting church and mission. A central criticism of the mission of the so-called Western church is that it fell into syncretism. Of course, these scholars are being a little subversive here because that's exactly what they were being accused of, right? Proclamation became propaganda. It became an admixture of a domineering culture and Christianity resulting in the disparagement of other cultures and other races. However, with the West's loss of moral authority after two world wars, a shift takes place. The post-war missionary ecumenical movement became much more circumspect about the agency of Western actors. And a theological shift takes place. There was a move away from talk of the church's mission towards talk about the mission of God. And on this shift, David Bosch writes this, quote, there is church because there is mission, not vice versa. To participate in mission is to participate in the movement of God's love toward people, since God is a fountain of sending love. A church doesn't exist for mission. The church exists because of God's mission. The church exists through mission. Taking heed or participating in God's mission is not an activity of the church. It is the identity of the church. Ephesians, in Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ might live for the praise of his glory. In the congregation, this praise participating in the breaking in realities of Easter and the yet to be revealed fuller realities of God's promise centers on the resurrected Christ's movement to the Father and to the world. Human agency thus put in its rightful place means a dependence upon the grace of God. The creatureliness of the community becomes a means of grace because it participates in the grace of God in word and in sacrament. Worship as submission to Christ's lordship, as discernment of the presence of Christ in the world, and as a participation in Christ's risen life is constitutive of a church always in and to the world. It is, in the words of Pope Francis, always a church in departure. As we center ourselves on Christ, the Christ flung to the margins by empire, we are turned around to the margins of our communities. Indeed, if our ministries do not engage the neighborhood, then we have to consider to what extent our interest in the global is missiological escapism. We have to consider to what extent the global is not so much a discerning of God's mission, but a dismissal of God's mission in our lives. As we shall see 
presently, because that outward movement is nourished by the work and presence of Christ, the neighborhood, of course, is not the whole story. Christian mission is always to the neighborhood and to the nations, but it is never not the neighborhood. Thesis three, mission is never simply local. The third thesis responds to the problems with inculturation. If by that term we mean a kind of top-down um, introduction of particular ways of uh, theological thought and practice. And that's what I do mean by it for today at least. While thesis number three therefore responds to the criticism that local theologizing was suppressed, the response is not simply to displace inculturation with a radical pluralism of local theologies. Rather, what we're aiming at is an intercultural theology, an intercultural Christian mission, and that only happens in intercultural partnership relationships. In the current Anglican controversies, of which I assume you've heard, there can be in some quarters an impulse to isolationism. However, to reduce mission simply to a local or even national context is to isolate ourselves from the voice of God's grace and the voice of God's judgment across difference. Such an impulse, if acted upon, would further embed the very thing these scholars are trying to get us beyond. One way of understanding the problem in Beatty and Mugambi have with missionary practice is that missionaries were in danger of accusing, uh, confusing the particularity of their usness with the universality that belongs only to God. In contrast, an approach to mission that rightly necessitates contextualization will also be mission that necessitates intercontextualization. What on earth does that mean? When we take pictures around this place, or at least uh, when I'm in a, pi a picture, we don't say cheese before the camera clicks, we say interculturality. See? <laughs> Gets everybody smiling, see? So what do we mean by intercontextualization? I think what we mean simply is, is a network, it's a fellowship, it's a communion of believers ever in conversational relationship about their understandings and practices of the faith. This is the practice of a lived faith that brings together testimony with counter-testimony, narrative with counter-narrative, agreement with disagreement. We might even see this as a communion that practices a kind of Catholicity from below. It calls all churches to give an account of how their hope in Christ plays out in their particular contexts. And whatever else might be said of this thesis, one thing should be said plainly. Intercultural theologizing, despite the fancy term, is not a specialism. Not a specialism of the work of academics, certainly. Cross-cultural voices, texts, partnerships, beyond the formative and dominant cultures and voices of a given congregation, become part of how believers understand and practice formation. So to its seminary, intercultural theology also becomes vital to a capacious renewal of mission and critical theology. We are in need of a more expansive view of communion centered on testimony, testimony of Christ. This expansiveness of God's mission, of course, needs further definition. For in any practice of intercultural theology that simply does not resign itself to the inevitability of ever-increasing theological and relational isolationism, will also need to commit deeply to an expansive ecumenism, which is our next thesis. 
These scholars despair at both the denominational competition and denominational proliferation in practices of mission. Their response? Practice an expensive ecumenism. The why of an expansive ecumenism is, of course, founded on the gospel of reconciliation. The mission of God through Christ reconciles God's creation to God's self. The church is the reconciled and reconciling body of Christ. The call of the church to witness to God's reconciliation in Christ. While reconciliation is an act of God, Humans are called to this mission as embodiments of God's community of reconciliation. Indeed, the message and the practice of reconciliation in a world of seemingly insatiable brutality may be the most compelling way of expressing the mission of God today. Of course, reconciling practices are complicated not least because the church has been complicit in violence and has not always been a just arbiter. Reconciling practices are therefore both in-reach and outreach. Reconciling practices are about the church witnessing to God's reconciliation in the ways it laments its own failures, analyzes how power functions, struggles to be more just in its dealings and humbly reaches out to the wider society in providing particular philosophical, religious analysis of conflict undergirded by a prophetic impulse that because God wills peace, it is sometimes possible. How do we engage those who belong to the family but may be in dispute with us? Is it possible to be mission partners across theological, cultural, philosophical divides. The what of an expansive ecumenism begins, I think, with holding onto a vision for the deepest form of visible unity possible. If reconciliation is a particularly potent expression of God's mission, then the world will experience this in the way Christians embody this reconciliation, organizationally, institutionally. An expansive ecumenism is expansive also in that it will be committed to the deepest possible exploration and cooperation across religious traditions. If God is the agent of God's mission, If the Spirit of Christ is at work in the world, then as Mbiti reminds us, the Spirit of God is already at work in places where the church is not present. An expanse of ecumenism is open to exploring an understanding and practice of mission that is nourished by interreligious thought and exploration. That's what the fourth integrative question tries to get at. So, the most warmly welcomed two words of the whole presentation, in conclusion. In conclusion, the scriptures, not least Ephesians, declare that God is love. Eternal, overflowing, creative, recreative love. Inviting people into that vision and reality is the first call of the church in mission. Inviting people into a sacred, sacramental, spacious experience and vision of divine love, that is the call of taking heed of God's mission broken open in the life and work of Jesus Christ. As you know, it's the 20th anniversary of the Center for Anglican Communion Studies, so we've been having a year-long party at Virginia Seminary. And part of the party was to invite invite and celebrate with the presiding bishop. And he was here in February. And I was particularly struck by the presiding bishop's answer to a question we asked him. The question was, why does the Episcopal Church need world Anglicanism? His answer was as straightforward 
as it was powerful. We need the Anglican communion, he said, because lives depend upon it. Quite literally, people have perished because of a faulty theology of mission that conflated Western priorities and theologies with the will of God. That possibility is always open, especially to parts of our communion where economic and cultural dominance is possible. The antidote is not to begin with new strategies, the latest guru, or the most recent trends in the academy. The antidote is a robust theology of mission. It is to do the hard work of articulating a vision of God that faces the criticism and at the same time to shun the impulse to reductionism and isolationism. It is to live into an in intercultural mission that God gifts us in the Anglican communion. It is, in short, to rediscover the boundary crossing God in fellowship and in partnership within and without our contexts. Yes, it is to recognize that mission connects us, God, world, church. Thank you. Dr. Heaney, thank you for starting our conversation with such a powerful, worshipful experience of recognizing the, the love and grace of God in which we all live and move and dwell. Uh, what a good way to begin. And to model that, we want to invite you into a time of conversation beginning with conversation with your neighbor. And so turn to someone close to you. And we'll have just a few minutes here, about 10 minutes of talking with one another, um, building some of that um, connection and relationship that we know that God models with all of us. So talk with your neighbor. What did you hear? Uh, what surprised you in Dr. Heaney's comments? What questions are you left with? Just let that percolate uh, within you for a little bit in conversation with a neighbor. And after that, Ken and Kafuenka will share some remarks, and um, then we'll have some continued conversation together. So turn to a neighbor and discuss for a few minutes one-on-one. Um, -on -one. It's good to see so much good, enthusiastic conversation happening around the room. But we're going to continue the conversation between Dr. Heaney and Canon Kafuenka uh, with Canon Kafuenka's response to Dr. Heaney's presentation, and then there will be opportunity for more small group discussion around your tables. Ken and John. Good morning. I would like to begin by uh, giving thanks uh, to God for the privilege to be here uh, with you this, uh, this week, and giving thanks to um, the organizers of the conference and for the invitation for me to be here. And no doubt, uh, uh, thanks to, to VTS uh, for enabling me to, uh, to be here too. But I also bring greetings, uh, before I begin, I bring greetings to from my, um, my office in the Anglican Communion office in London, from the Secretary General and my colleagues and staff uh, with whom I work. They are uh, thinking of us here and, um, and they are sending their love and greetings. Um, I really want to say how grateful I am for Dr. Heaney's uh, presentation. Uh, such a great address uh, and indeed for its clarity, for its depth, uh, for its challenge. And I can see that there is indeed a lot to chew over for each one of us who are here. And I can't agree more indeed for the need for the mission, for the theology of mission. Mission begins in and with God. 
And I can't agree more with that, uh, uh, Robert. And there's a necessity, indeed, of the appropriate and proper theology of mission, as that leads to proper practice. We need to get the theology right, the theology that rebellates, theology that dignifies others rather than dehumanize them, theology that gives hope for all and not just a few, theology that calls us to repentance and to acknowledge our sinfulness rather than simply uh, gross over or rather what other people call cheap grace. Theology that begins with creation and one which is anchored in the person and life of Jesus Christ. And we know that apart from what uh, Dr. Heaney has said, there are, we've had many bad theologies in the world. We know the apartheid uh, practice in South Africa was a theology, uh, something that was endorsed by a particular theology. Uh, it was a theology that insisted on understanding that there are other people are less human than others. And we need certainly to develop a better and good theology. But I've also heard of people who insist that uh, they cannot do anything until they have articulated and written up a theology of whatever it is that they are to do. My people in my village, they leave out their theology, they don't wait to write up a theology, and they don't wait to articulate a theology at all. They leave their theology in the way in which they live their lives, as part of their calling, but also they see that as part of their calling in their baptism and their baptism vows that they commit. And we also know, of course, that Paul's theology of mission uh, came uh, from a lived experience of Christians, as of course they wrestled with what it meant to be disciples of Jesus Christ in their context of life. So yes, sometimes we, our theology is going to come out of the lived experience and the way in which we have been challenged by the world in which we live and the context in which we live our faith. Uh, Dr. Heaney um, lamented on the five marks of mission, if I may put it that way, and, and not totally agreeing with him that worship is not one of the marks of mission. And the, over the past decade that I have worked at the Anglican Communion Office in the mission department, there has been several proposals to expand the marks of mission. Uh, and in fact, uh, what uh, have rightly been uh, articulated here in this college as the marks of love. And there have also been uh, people who have said that actually we have already five. Adding one more would actually give the, a different number to what we already have. Others have said that uh, the moment you articulate and add another one, then you will open up a Pandora's box and you don't know where you're going to be ending. So there have been issues to do with whether or not we expand on the five marks of mission. But I want also to say uh, that while there is no mark of mission on worship, I wish to suggest that in fact the marks of mission are actually impo an important content of and for and of worship. Worship, in a way, for me, I see it as broad and overarching, that reducing it to a mark of mission might, in a way, uh, not do justice to the act of worship. But I also wish to submit that my view of worship is, to con is connected with our discipleship. And therefore, it's more than just what happens when we gather in our church or in our chapel, but actually it includes living out the implications in everyday life of our faith and indeed of our worship. At the end of the gathered worship in our Anglican Episcopalian churches, we have a liturgy which sends us out. Go in peace to love and save the Lord. To continue in our worship with, of God. The whole of our life is therefore must be an act of worship and glory to God. 
So the call in the commandment to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and to love your neighbor as you love yourself, is in fact the ultimate call to worship of God. Indeed, mission is what God has already done in creating and in saving the world, rather than what we do. It's about being and living what God has already done. In listening to uh, Dr. Heaney's presentation, I felt an echo that was coming through of what uh, Professor Andrew was, a Scottish professor, calls the Fijian moment. Fijian moment happening in our time, which brings a church more culturally diverse than it has ever been before, potentially, therefore, nearer to what the full stature of the full stature of Christ that belongs to his summing up of humanity. That we are experiencing in our time, when Ruoz would say, a great multitude that no one could ever number, as it comes in Revelation chapter 7, verse 9, from every nation and from every tribe and from every language. That we are, for him, and Ruoz sees that uh, the expansion of the church, particularly within what may be considered to be the global south, or indeed the majority world, that speaks of what the vision moment uh, is about. That you have got people all over the world confessing Jesus Christ as Lord, but also willing to cooperate and work together, bringing the whole gospel to the whole world. Wars believes this is realized as a great multitude of majority world become dominant in Christianity. The dominant is being tested, of course, in terms of our time. The dominant is being, this dominant is being tested in terms of the level of quality and discipleship. Just like that dominance was tested in Europe during the period we, talked about, we heard about the World War. And then I think maybe connected with that is what has been described in terms of that dominance of the growth of the church in the global south in Asia, in Latin America, and in Africa. It is true that the Christian numerical presence, and especially the Anglican presence in Africa, is more than in the Western world. At the 1910 uh, Edinburgh Conference, where world evangelization was the theme, Africa was not on the agenda at that time. In fact, it was seen as a fertile soil for Islam, and therefore a place that no resources should be wasted. And therefore, to see the growth of the church in Africa as we do, it is something to be celebrated and is something to be thankful to God for. I must say, however, that it's actually the African leaders themselves, no doubt many Anglican leaders, who are able to acknowledge that numerical growth alone has not addressed the myriad of the challenges that the continent of Africa faces and continues to face. Recently, I was in Malawi and speaking at the Bishop of Lake Malawi in a conference where we were looking at the whole, the, the, the discipleship of the whole people of God. Bishop of Lake Malawi said that Malawi has 80% of Christians, and yet Malawi is one of the most corrupt countries in the world. And he went on to say that business owners in this country, majority of those are Christians. Most of our police officers are Christians. Most of our politicians are Christians. And most of our employer, employees and employers are Christians. And these are members of our churches. And he said, he said this, that if Malawi is sick, it is because the church is sick. And he lamented and said, having said that, then he said, what we need in this country, what we need in our continent, is the emphasis on the discipleship of the whole people of God. And that is what majority of the Anglican African leaders at the moment are focusing on. Of course, there is growing desire by many uh, Christians in Asia, in Africa, in recent years and decades, to go to Europe, uh, possibly America as well, 
uh, you know, because of the concern for the falling numbers in the Christian presence. In fact, in the last uh, 20 years or so, uh, Koreans have been uh, the largest missionary sending, Korea has been the largest mission sending country in the world. There is, uh, for me, I see that there is need for a coordinated cooperation among various stakeholders. Otherwise, some of the things that are uh, um, Dr. Heaney has raised in terms of the colonial legacy, we are bound to repeat those if we are not properly coordinated and reoriented ourselves with the past experiences that have happened. But I must say that there are a number of uh, churches, there are a number of uh, uh, places where things are happening. And I can testify certainly in terms of what I know we, in the country where I'm currently based, in the United Kingdom, uh, the Roman Catholic Church particularly has, and partly because they have had you know, dwindling numbers of clergy, they have had to reach out to the global south, if you like. And the, in the area where I live, and this is not just about the Roman Catholic Church, the area where I live in West London, we've got a Methodist church there. We've got uh, um, a Reformed church. Uh, we've got Roman Catholic church. We've got an Anglican church. We've got Seventh-day Adventist. We've got five churches. In the Methodist church, the current pastor or priest there is a Zimbabwean. Recently, he's just replaced a Ghanaian. We've got in the Seventh-day Adventist, it's a Jamaican. Uh, we've got in the Reformed church, uh, is an Indian. We've got in the Catholic church, until recently it was a Nigerian, but now he's an Italian. And in our Anglican church, we have someone from the Caribbean. And so that's the kind of scenario that you are seeing in the world and in terms of looking at uh, some of the issues that have been raised. But that has been done in a way that recognizes that actually we've got people that can bring some gifts to us that we do not have. But also that we can collaborate and work together. And until, unless there is that co collaboration to happen, uh, it is difficult for us to be able to harness the gifts that they are there and that are abundant. In fact, on Good Friday, in our area that I discussed, I talked about what we do, except the Seventh-day Adventists, the rest of all those four churches, we do a walk of witness, uh, the walk of the, of, the, of the cross. And we move from one church to one another church, one church to another church, until we end up, we have been ending up in the last few years at the Catholic Church, and then we have a lunch together or a meal together there. I mean, it's wonderful to see uh, the, the image that you see in that, in that place, not just in terms of denomination, but not just in terms of the color, not just, in, but you know, it's just that kind of the fission moment kind of thing and the kind of thing that uh, 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 Dr. Robert uh, has hinted on. It is something that you see the celebration of the whole people of God together. There is, uh, as I conclude, and the best term that anyone else would like to see is about conclusion. Uh, the, you raise an issue on, uh, continue to raise, we raise an issue on colonization and exploitation and brutalization of cultures and the peoples uh, during colonial legacy. And of course, I want to say that I think that is not limited to Africa alone. It happened certainly in Asia, but we also saw that it happened in, uh, in, in North America where we are here. It happened in Australia. It happened in New Zealand. Um, it happened in South America. And I think we need to realize that, in fact, the pain and humanization that happened during time sometimes continues today to disfigure the image of God in many of our peoples. And I think as we look to the other side, we need also to be looking to where we are right on the ground where we are. Because we have actually people who have had a similar experience as the Africans out there right on our soils. And I just wanted to bring that up as, um, as, as, as a matter of agency, if you like. Uh, and therefore, and just agreeing with you quite a lot, is that any, therefore, any mission theology, in my view, must therefore take very seriously the local experience. Any mission theology or any mission connection must take seriously, and I'm going to bring this up quite strongly in my own, in my own presentation, must, must seriously take note of the local, the current, but also the historical experiences of our nations and our times and our country. There will be a few more things that are, we will discuss and I don't want to end here by simply saying how grateful I am for, for me to be here and to hear uh, to that wonderful presentation. You know, the two people that you picked out 
uh, Mugambi, um, and Mbiti. I met them last month in Tanzania at the World Council of Churches, and it was wonderful to speak to them. These are great leaders that we personally and many others admire quite a lot. And so thank you for the opportunity to reflect. Blessings. And John, thank you for um, such insightful response, and we look forward to more on Friday. And at this time, we invite you to continue the conversation around your tables, expand a little bit beyond um, just one or two people to a group conversation around the table. Take the blue sheet that was in your packets. Um, there are some questions that uh, Dr. Haney and uh, Dr. Cannon Kafwenka have given us to think about together and to share together. And there's an opportunity as well to um, think practically about how might our experiences together in worship or in uh, mission settings help us expand and live out some of this theology of mission that they're inviting us to embrace. So we'll have, I think, about 30 minutes in our small group conversations. We'll keep you posted and let you know how the time is going along. Um, but please begin that conversation together about... Um, how we think about our theology and mission, develop that, and live it out in our own communities. Well, friends, I think we're ready to continue the conversation. Um, we've, we've had two good presenters um, give us a lot of ideas to get us started. And what we'll do for the next few minutes is, is have a conversation uh, between them, but also with all of us. And I'll be inviting you at different times if there are particular questions you want to share with our presenters. Hartley will have a microphone and if you'll, if you'll raise a hand, she'll get that to you so that we can all hear. Um, but first, thank you both for sitting down for some conversation today and for helping us get started in God, get started in thinking about um, the expansive love of God and how that shapes all of our lives and all of our work together. And so where I wanted to begin is just by asking each of you, when did you become aware of that um, grounding in God as the basis for mission? When did that light bulb go off for each of you and you began to realize that, that mission is who God is, mission is the, the love of God enacted in the world and that we take part in that? When did that vision of mission begin to develop for each of you? Would you like to go first? Yeah. Um... The funny accent um, is because I, I'm a priest in the Church of Ireland. I grew, I grew up in Ireland. Um, and I think grew up in a parish that was very engaged with the outward looking mission, very much um, from a tradition that proclamation was the thing. I've kind of been in this funny journey where I shied away from that and now I'm kind of coming back around to, we've got to grapple with um, that tenor and mode and attribute of mission. So I think grow, growing up um, in an ordinary parish um, where mission was important, where evangelism was important, where formation was taken seriously, uh, where before you got confirmed you did two years of theological work with the rector. <laughs> um, so I think it's, for me it started in the parish mm -hmm. and then of course with um, academic training, um, uh, Theolo theological themes begin to work on you. I think ecumenical documents, I think Roman Catholic theology is particularly strong in this, this area of um, the, that mission is um, grounded in the, in the nature of God. And it's kind of historically that move that's made in the modern missionary movement as well. So I guess the short answer is formation in the parish experience internationally, and then the more reading mm -hmm. and the academic mm -hmm. piece, I think, mm -hmm. kind of contributed to, uh, so it's a gradual thing. It wasn't a conversion experience, it was a gradual thing. Okay, thank you. John, what about you? John, what about you? I think that's where probably to begin from, it's uh, the gradual uh, aspect of it. Um, but also I, I grew up in, um, and born in a very uh, rural part of uh, Zambia, northern part of Zambia. Um, and within my uh, culture and tradition, um, the religious nature of the people is 
uh, it's something you are born into, you are born with. Um, and the awareness of God and presence of God is something that uh, uh, you, you grow up in. And uh, I, to some extent, I, as I was growing up, I got to struggle quite a little bit with some of the uh, kind of theologies that I, I found that are uh, <clears throat> uh, categorized, if you like, or compartmentalized mm -hmm. life, uh, but also compartmentalized uh, the uh, our Christian faith, uh, what is sacred and what is, uh, uh, what is not. I, I struggled with that, partly because for me I grew up in terms of background, understanding first and foremost that uh, the creation, the, what you see, that is actually God's its origin from God. Yeah. And so when you see a mountain, when you see a hill, when you see a big tree, and of course, there was a misunderstanding for the, um, I don't want to blame the early missionaries for everything, but there was a misunderstanding about how, um, you know, when we worshipped under a tree, that we were worshipping a tree. When we did that under the mountain, that we were worshipping a mountain. But actually, it was a, it, it was a reverence to God for such a beautiful thing that has existed. And through it, you see the power of God uh, emanating. And so there is an element of that within my cultural bringing up, if you like, that I, um, but, I, but I, again, in, in terms of for me, when I came to realize later on, as I was in secondary school, I grew up in an Anglican uh, family, uh, but my, uh, my general faith uh, grew um, a lot more when I was in uh, secondary school, I was in scripture union. Um, and where we, we, we wrestled with what it means for me to be, to be a Christian, what it means for me to be a follower of Jesus. And for me, the, the, that aspect that uh, God's love, God loves me unconditionally uh, to, to the extent that, uh, you know, I, I felt so embraced within that, that, uh, you know, if that, that deep love of God for me who is a nothing, who, you know, I'm a sinner in all kinds of ways, and then just to see that embracing love of God. And that kind of realization for me was very important in my journey of faith understanding of uh, how, you know, really my whole, whether it's me in terms of my person, uh, but also my life, my experience, my faith, emanates from, uh, from there. And of course, within the, the theological uh, training, um, you come to the sense of the triune God, uh, you know, coming from the creation. For me, creation was very important. Uh, the creation, the whole creation, uh, you, know, you know, and the, the John chapter 3, verse 16, God so loved the world thing, I mean, uh, you know, sending, and, and all that for me, and the, for the biblical, the Bible, the uh, formation, no doubt, um, because part of, part of that when we were in, the, in, um, in, in, in the scripture, you know, in secondary school, uh, the Bible uh, is very, was very an important aspect of, uh, you couldn't go anywhere without, uh, without your Bible. And, and so the reading of scripture was very essential and very important, um, both also just in terms of parishes and congregation, uh, the small community within our, every parish in Zambia, for instance, I mean, whether it's an Anglican church or Catholic church or United Church of Zambia, they have got what, you know, uh, community meetings, I mean, uh, uh, family meetings, not family meetings, but uh, uh, sometimes they call them cell groups, sometimes they call them, you know, but, but they meet to reflect on scripture and reflecting on scripture and leaving that out in their context, whether it's visiting a hospital, whether it's going to prison, whether it's what, I mean, again, but again it comes out of that deep understanding of God's love mm -hmm. and God's love through Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, beginning from creation there. Yeah. So yes, it's, I think it's been a journey for me as well as uh, yeah. I can hear from my colleague there. And, and just to follow up with both of you, and how did you, how did you come to understand that mission is more about God's love and God's work than ours? That, it, that it's starting from there. Do you want to go first, John? Or go? Well, I think it's probably what I've already hinted on. I think uh, for me, it, it is first and foremost to understand uh, that God's, in God's own way, God's own right, and God's own uh, um, created the world. Uh, no one, uh, you know, it, it, it was God's initiative mm -hmm. to create. Um, and, and, and it was God's initiative to create and therefore to make what is uh, available to be. Uh, but also it was God's initiative uh, to, to, re to redeem us. Uh, 
uh, through, through Christ. Uh, having used various other ways in which to get us to himself, having moved away from, uh, from God, uh, you know, but it's God's initiative again to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is nothing of a human initiative, mm -hmm. nothing of the world initiative, it's God's initiative, mm -hmm. both in terms of creation but also in terms of redemption. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, but, but, but it is that which is coming purely out of God's own love mm -hmm. and God's own desire to make that be, uh, to... Uh, Yes, uh, I think for me, therefore, my understanding is it doesn't matter whether I love God, whether I know God, whether it doesn't change who God is towards mm -hmm. us and towards humanity and towards creation mm -hmm. because that's, that's who God is. Mm -hmm. you know, so my not believing God does not change God's relationship, God's love for me. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's that kind, of, uh, that kind of depth of understanding that you know, um, through the journey uh, has, has been very pivotal in, a, in, in that understanding. Okay. Yeah, and I would echo its, you know, short answer is formation broadly conceived. People in my life, uh, leaders in formation and experiences and particular readings. So it's, yeah. I think it's so then um, to follow up on that then, how do we form people in this theology of mission? How do we form, and, and is the, does the theology come first or the lived experience of it, or does that matter? Or do you want to go first? You want to go or, first? Okay, I'll go first. Okay. Um, so there's two questions there, right? Um, so uh, the lived experience with the theology, we've been talking a little bit about this, and I think, of course, uh, it's a both and, not an either or story, right? Um, um, so when we talk about the lived experience um, of church, ordinary so-called church scores, wherever they're at in the communion, um, versus this kind of more formal published theology. I think God is at work in God's word and we're all theologians, right? Um, we speak the words of God in our context. So it has to be, I think it has to be a both and. I think um, there is implicit theologies in every single one of us and in every congregation. We believe certain things about God and the gospel and the world. Uh, and we act upon them, and sometimes if we were to begin with the lived practice, um, we might be surprised about what we really believe if our, how we live was tested against what we say, right? I know I would, that would be, that's always an interesting exercise. Um, so it has to be both. I think there has to be a, a dialogue. I think a seminar is particularly well-placed to have those conversations between congregations and ministries and more formal theology. I think there are really interesting examples of that throughout the communion, like you know, the work of Gerald West at KwaZulu Natal. They have you know, taken theologians out into the community and together with local people, they've read scripture together and really taken seriously lived experience and context in conversation with the more formal theology. So for me, it, it, it has to be both, and when that conversation gets going, however it is grounded in a particular context, I think that's when robust uh, formation and mission uh, happens. So I think, yeah, I think in, an I, in, in the best possible world, it's that conversation, right? Where we resource one another, where the congregation is in conversation with what's happening in the academy or in scholarship. Mm -hmm. And of course, the other thing to say, as a last thing to say, every theologian, even if their job is to you know, get paid for talking, they're also living people, right? Um, why I'm a theologian has got a lot to do with the lived experience I've had, the experiences I've had, I've had in my family and my context, and those are experiences that are ongoing that inform theology and thinking. Right now, I'm finishing a book, and it's about this field of post-colonial theology, and the first chapter is about this whole idea of particularity. Every theology is located. And I was waxing lyrical, I thought, about this whole concept, but I hadn't revealed my own location or my own history. Mm. So the whole first chapter had to be completely rewritten to say, this is who I am, this is where I've come from, this is how I struggle with the histories and the, the context and the violence of my own context. Um, so yeah. Both and. Uh, I think formation is an ongoing journey. 
And I, I see um, as beginning right, right from the time one is born. Um, as I said, I was born in an Anglican family with my, my parents, my mom, much more stronger in terms of faith and church attendance than my dad was. Um, you know, she was uh, a woman of deep faith, uh, but she nurtured us uh, in, her, uh, in, in that family, uh, the ways in which we were loved, uh, but also we were exposed to uh, both in terms of attending of church and of course uh, uh, we surrendered for baptism, uh, baptized when I was uh, fairly young, uh, confirmed at the time when I was uh, almost finishing my primary school. Um, and I think, you know, they, they, there were various things that are going on within, within that. I mean, I had friends um, uh, who were, were Christians, but also friends who came from different uh, traditions. Mm -hmm. Some of my friends were Roman Catholic, so we would sometimes go and worship in a Roman Catholic church. And at that time, for us, you know, the denomination was not a thing. Uh, we, that was not something we cared about. We, you know, we, we moved and rotated like that. But also, I think also there is something about modeling that, uh, um, you know, in some uh, instances, I think many people are complaining about we are lacking models and modeling. I think uh, there are many uh, people that inspired me in my faith journey that I could look to and see that, uh, uh, you know, not necessarily that I want to be like them, but that, you know, the kind of uh, life, uh, the way in which they related to, 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 to people or to me, it's something that inspired, I wanted to see something behind that. What is it that rested behind that? And so um, there, there, is, there is that, and I think uh, also for me in terms of exposure through the scripture union I talked about, again, that, you know, there was uh, intentional um, a Christian presence within a school and, and therefore, you know, that, 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 that was part of formation. We talked about the, the small groups meetings in our, in our churches, in locations. That, for me, that was also moments and, and process of formation. But I, I also later on became a Sunday school teacher. Mm. And I learned a lot from the young children. The questions they, rest, they asked and the kind of things that they posed. And so, I mean, I think, you know, for me, formation in terms of, I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all that. And I just want to reflect um, um, what are a number of our leaders are asking. I think there are quite a number of leaders who are asking today. I meet so many bishops, whether it's archbishops, anyone you can think about, I meet them and we speak and share and, and relate to, to each other. But quite a number of people, are, leaders are asking, they're saying that uh, we, uh, they are pointing to theological institutions. Some of the leaders are pointing to theological institutions. They're saying that uh, we are lacking deep uh, levels of formation in our parishes, in our congregations. And we, you know, we, we, there is a, almost an understanding or a feeling that uh, theological institutions are not forming uh, clergy enough to be able to replicate that in their congregations. Mm -hmm. So there is that kind of wrestling of that. But I've actually retorted back to the bishops. Once they, sometimes they say, and I can hear them say that. And I can hear what they are meaning in, in what they're saying. But also I say to them, you know, you just think about the fact that in a theological institution, uh, they, they will spend about two or three years of learning and of formation. Uh, but, you know, before that, they have been a part of a parish and a congregation. You know, so we cannot simply blame a theological institution through which a person has gone for three years or two years uh, for not having done a good job. And I'm you know, asking, you know, maybe we need to be asking about the good job being done in our parishes. What are we doing in our congregations? What sort of formation uh, are we doing, that ongoing formation? What about in our families, you know, with children? And how are we doing that? Because sometimes also as parents and what, we relegate that to the church to do it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a church, it's a Sunday school. And then we are forgetting that actually we are part and parcel of that means and channel of formation. And I think for me, it's, 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 uh, it's a whole circle round, if you like. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of theology and formation, I, you know, Robert has put it rightly, yes, it's both ways. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we are formed by, being, by engaging. Um, and I think we also uh, read, we read, we've got the scriptures. And so there is, yes, we are all theologians. We are all mission theologians. But I think we are not mission theologians that are simply to articulate the theology in theory, but it's a theology that we have to live out. 
It's a theology that we have to live out. And I think for me, that's where the theology is not just a, a theoretical theology, but actually it's a theology, therefore, that has to be lived out. Mm -hmm. So it's both and. It's a theology, but a theology that are, has to be lived out. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get it out by living it out, and sometimes you read it and do it. So uh -huh. it's, it's yeah. that way. Both directions. Yeah. Um, thank you both. Are there questions that emerge from any of your groups that you'd like to ask our presenters? Hartley, can you get the microphone to Titus there? And if you would, please stand. Thank you. Thank you so much, Robert and John. Without a theology of mission, we perish. I would like to ask you to apply this to a situation that is very common in this room among all of these various mission activists from around the church. Imagine, each of you, that you are a diocesan mission advisor and a parish has come to you for advice and accompaniment because they feel a call to a village in Honduras where there is an overcrowded school that the folks there would like to expand and there is a need for potable drinkable water and they want to gather a team of say a dozen or 15 people to go down and spend three weeks there and they would like you to advise them in advance and accompany them through the process. You're going to go to Honduras with them. Imagine what you would be encouraging them to be and to do during that process. You want to go first? Well, I think, uh, um, I I'll, first and foremost, I'm not sure whether I'll be going to Honduras, Honduras anyway, first. <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> um, not that I don't love Honduras. Actually, I love, I want to go there. But uh, I just, I, I think uh, um, th there is probably a lot that I need to understand in the question that Tata was asking. And thank you for raising it up. But uh, maybe there's a lot that I need to understand in there. Um, but part of me is to first and foremost understand this passion that uh, our people have in this congregation, does it relate to the passion that the people in Honduras actually have about what they are looking for? Mm. It is not simply about what we are going to do in Honduras, but actually, what is it actually? What actually is the main thing that Honduran people are looking for, or they want to do, or they want to achieve? Um, do, do, are they, do they want, uh, you know, uh, are they looking for us to go? Or is it something that we, of course, you know, we, 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 we have the edge, we feel the call, we have that, but we need to test that out. I think part of it for me is to ensure that we test that out. Maybe that's where we'll be beginning from, in terms of testing out. Um, and I think, uh, you know, uh, asking a real question, is this really what our sisters and brothers are looking for? Um, uh, and because there's, there are quite a number of times that uh, we do impose our own uh, feeling of what we think our people on the other side are looking for, mm -hmm. or the, you know, the answers to the questions that our, our brothers have, or we develop our own questions for the situations we see on the ground. Um, I'll be reflecting on some of this uh, in my presentation tomorrow, mm -hmm. so I was <laughs> hesitant to say, to say much. But, um, but I think for me, I'll be, I want to wrestle with the group before, uh, before we do anything with Honduras, but also I need to understand more about the context within Honduras. What is actually happening uh, out, uh, down there? But also to say, I mean, one of the things for me I would want to say probably is to say that uh, if indeed we establish that this is what the need is and they are looking for, for that, um, is to say that uh, uh, do we really need to go? Uh, how many of us are going? What are we going to do? What is our motivation? I think we need to be asking those questions. What is, what is our motivation? What are we going to do? And then at, at the end of the day, we also need to wrestle with the fact that uh, uh, we, are not there, we, we are not going there as the doers. Because that's, for me, the challenge sometimes that happens. We are not going there as the doers to go and help out the poor people in Honduras. We need to ask ourselves, what is our mission in reality where we are coming from? I think that's where, for me, the mission context becomes very important. What actually is our mission context here within where we are? Uh, what, you know, if we are wrestling with the issue of Honduras, are there not similar situations in our context that are similar to Honduras? 
we need to be asking those questions. And I'm not saying that we relegate the issue on the other side, but I think we need to wrestle with those issues so that when we do, uh, we need to be able to talk not just about what we have found, but we need to be talking about our own context and situation when we are in, in Honduras. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, uh, we, the, the, question, the, the challenges that emerge out of that is first and foremost that uh, we may end up projecting what we see as a need. Secondly, we may end up uh, uh, wanting to do things and we may end up not learning anything out of where we are going. Because at the end of the day, uh, those people have a lot more to teach us what we can learn from. But if we go with the attitude of going to do, it blares completely, you know, eclipses our need to learn or to be enriched when we are on Jura. So I think for me, I will need to wrestle with a few questions before I can, I can be on that journey with, yeah. <laughs> with my colleagues. Yeah. So I, I think I'll need to tease out quite a little bit uh, with my colleagues, with that group before I go yeah. to Honduras. Thank you. Yeah. Do you want to respond? Yeah, I, there's nothing I disagree with. Um, uh, there's a colleague of mine that uh, tells the story that uh, a parishioner came with a similar request at, of course, the step of the church on the way out on Sunday morning. God has called me to do X. And the response of the rector was, funny you should say that. I was talking to God this morning, and God did not mention it to me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, that, that is not the recommended response. <laughs> uh, um, I think in broad terms, absolutely where John is at, you know, I think... Um, I don't have to imagine being in that position. I have been in that position many times. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a teaching formational moment. Great, you know. You have a vision for connecting with people. Let's explore that, you know. Let's, let's talk about what call is. Let's talk about vocation. Let's connect with the bishop. Let's connect with the congregation. Let's tease this out. But are you committed? to the pilgrimage and the journey it's going to take to test the call and to make the connection with sisters and brothers. Mm -hmm. So another question. From, yes, ma'am. Hartley will bring you the microphone. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mwape. I'm coming from Zambia. My uh, observation, I want to say thank you to um, Dr. Hin and uh, to Father Kafanka for the message that has been put across concerning uh, without theology of mission, the church perishes. I'm looking at um, a background uh, where John is very much aware, um, coming from Zambia together. We have a church that is now shrinking, that's the Anglican church. I'm looking at the situation of how do we build the Anglican church or the communion of church in Zambia in terms of our children and women. The segregation, of course, is there. There's no distinct equality where mission is reaching the youth in terms of moving away from the tradition. The church is more tradition to the aspect that as Mbiti and Magambe, the books that you've mentioned, is the enculturation of bringing in culture to permeate through with the Western culture in our local understanding. And going back, I'm looking at a critical way of identifying our historical background. Because if we do, we go back into history, it will be very difficult to change what we are looking at as the vision of having the church, instead of the church perishing, but the church to grow. Why I've said so, it's because we have all of us a background. As I heard the two of you, you are talking about where you're coming from, the background and so forth. It means that you cling to it. And uh, if we have to move, then it means we have to move beyond that, just like God's love goes beyond race, tribe, and creed. So the situation right now is, do we understand the critical situation that we are in? Are we understanding that God meant his love goes beyond the color of somebody? It's just like when you look at the flowers in your garden, 
Do they look the same? Is it white, black, or green? The beauty is what you see, and that's what God is seeing to all of us. I have a saying in uh, African, uh, understanding the, the African saying, which says, because my critical point right now is about the youth. Um, the saying in African is, uh, you nature the young trees, because that's the future forest. Imiti kula empanga, Father John. Thank you. So, which means that our point in mission, are we able to include in decision making the youth, who is very important? The youth is not in our church today because they want music which is active, vibrant. They want to dance. And that's the aspect now in the African culture. As an African theologian, myself, we are talking about bringing in the culture that will come to include the youth in the church because they are the future generation. Thank you. I thank you. John, would you like to respond to that and um, thinking about the future of the church in Africa, where this is, where this is headed? Uh, thank you for raising that. Uh, it's uh, something that I'm personally uh, passionate about, um, uh, both simply uh, because uh, of my own life journey, uh, not just as a youth, uh, you, know, I've, you know, within the church, but also having taught uh, young people but also, you know, within my work, uh, youth and young people, it's one of the big themes that we, we have. Um, just in terms of reflecting on the context uh, of Africa, uh, where particularly I've got a great concern, as uh, Mwapi has raised, if you look at the sub-Saharan Africa, um, a very conservative figure, and I'm giving you a very conservative figure, um, of about 60% of most sub-Saharan countries, 60% of the population are people below the age of 35 years. Huh. And I'm giving you a conservative figure of 60%. So basically what that means is that uh, anyone who is above 35 years is in minority. When one was in, so myself, I'm a minority within the context of sub-Saharan Africa. And so for me, we are not talking about the change for tomorrow. We are actually talking about the generation, the change for today. Mm -hmm. And that's how urgent it is. And uh, the question for me, the question of formation becomes very relevant. Um, and I think in, when we're talking about formation, we cannot but have the the, 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 the young people and children are at the very center mm -hmm. of that formation. Mm -hmm. Because unless we are able to touch and tap into that and, and, and form this generation, uh, we are looking at a very bleak kind of future. Mm -hmm. uh, we are looking about a very bleak uh, tomorrow. And so for me, the, 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 actually the case is much more, it's very urgent. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more urgent and I think both, not just in terms of the church, I think it's both in terms of government and whatever, whatever level of life uh, we are at, is the question is what sort of capacity are we providing, whether it's in schools, whether it's uh, in terms of schooling, what kind of education are we providing, um, you know, what, what, what kind of uh, health facilities are we providing for that generation, what kind of formation in our churches are we providing? Because, uh, and I talk about this passionately uh, among our leaders, um, and, I, and I think it's something that's very central. As we speak now today, uh, there is within the Anglican Communion, uh, Kappa, which is the Anglican province, Council of Anglican Provinces in Africa, they have got a youth gathering um, for the whole continent. Oh, wow. They are meeting in Nairobi. I was supposed to be there. If I'm not here, I would have been there. So, uh, so it's, it's going on. And again, I think lot, lots of leaders are coming to that realization. But the challenge, of course, remains, is that quite a lot of us, including our leaders in, on the continent, we still invest most of the investment in terms of resources. We invest in the people above 40 years. So most of the resources, we're still putting it there. 
and I normally challenge our leaders and they say, if I speak, have a chance to speak to them about this, is to say that we are misplacing our resources. And the reason is this. We, if we are not investing in this, of course, what we are doing is we are trying to think that by investing in the people about that, because those are the people, if you like, who are bringing in income into the church. Mm. But actually, we are forgetting that these are the people who are going to be bringing in income tomorrow. Mm. Some of them actually today. Mm -hmm. So if, we, if income is an issue we are talking about, in fact, we are misplacing mm. the whole resource. So mm. it is, it is a, quite an important preoccupation. Uh, for me, it's an important uh, um, uh, scenario that we need to deal with. And every moment that I find, I talk about this. In fact, I, 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 I preached a sermon when I was in Lusaka very recently about the same. It was a youth Sunday. And I even said, I, what, I was, what I was doing shouldn't be the one who was preaching. Should have been a youth person who was preaching. Yeah. But however, the reality of young people and the investment in young people is so critical and central at the moment in our continent. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, we, we are a young generation at the moment in yeah. Africa. And I, I think that's true across the church in many ways. Yeah, so lots to learn and work on together. Um, I had one more question for Dr. Heaney, but our time is up. So I'm going to give it to all of you and encourage you to be in conversation with one another about this over lunch and um, throughout our gathering. Where are you seeing robust theologies of mission at work? And where are you seeing this image of uh, following God in love and in partnership? Where is that happening and to what effect? So um, thank you both for for giving us good food for thought as we've gotten started today. Um, as we get ready to close, I'd like you to, to take the blue sheet. And simply as, um, as a final doxology before David gives us some instructions for lunch, um, let's read the scriptures together again. We'll read this together aloud. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to gather up all things in him, things in heaven, and things on earth. Amen.